So when I first met my next guest, uh, fell in love. I thought he was just an amazing guy, open-hearted, uh, really great perspective in the world. I didn't quite know what he did for a living, but because of who he was, I invited him on my podcast uh, to share with you without knowing really what his expertise was. Then when I started to do some research, I found out that he works with gifted and talented people, with geniuses, with ultra, ultra high performance uh, type people. So think, think Michael Jordan and Michael Phelps. Think, think, think of those otherworldly type people. And I wondered, what am I going to do with him on this show? And the more I did research on him, the more I saw heart and humanity and and practicality in his work. And I said, okay, now I now I see the connection. This is this is a well-rounded guy who can bring a lot of value to you, my audience. So Alan Thompson is the founder of. Uh, life Architect, Interna it's an international life coaching practice that supports high ability clients. He's also the chairman of Mensa, this is where it gets intimidating, uh, Mensa International Gifted Children Youth Committee. That's a mouthful for a, a guy like me. Uh, he consults and contributes to docu-series, co you know, like Decoding Genius and Child Genius. He's written uh, quite a number of books. The book that I really like for, for all of us is Best, A Practical Guide to Living Your Best Life. Uh, Alan, thank you for being on the show. Thanks, Mark. That's a great intro, isn't it? Yeah, uh, you know, and it goes, <laughs> it, go, it does go on and on and on. You know, you're a young guy, and yeah. you've really accomplished, you've accomplished a lot. Uh, but again, like I said, you know, when we were talking before I even hit record, uh, uh, it was who you are that really wanted me to share you with the people that I love, which is, you know, the people who listen uh, on this podcast, and then seeing, you know, how you, how you translate that in the world. When I was reading about genius and gifted and otherworldly talents, uh, you know, I identify out. I'm just, a, I'm just a normal guy who's trying not to screw up his life, right? I'm trying to do a podcast where people are just trying to stay ahead in their job, take care of their elderly parents, right? Raise their kids, uh, deal with gaining 10 pounds and not being able to get in their clothes, right? And, you know, for me, that's winning at life. And if we can do some gravy, if we can do some Tony Robbins and really kind of up-level things, awesome, uh, but you know, like, how do I help the people who are really kind of in that squeeze? Uh, I'm wondering, you know, what what you can bring to the table. And when I when you know you talk about grit, you talk about resilience, and you know, the, bringing the humanity to all this, and also the to the gifted children, right? You, when you, when you talk about, it, you don't talk about grinding them into the ground. You talk about nurturing them and their gifts. Uh, so let's let's start with. Why do you care about this? How did you get into this focus in your career? What's the origin story? Oh, man, there's just so many places I want to take that listening to you speak. Um, so my background is going to be a lot of parallel paths. There's going to be a lot of uh, meandering around like all of us. And it's come about through, let's trace it back to an interest in, in live sound, in performing arts, in computing, in personal development, even at a young age, in public speaking, all these things kind of tied together, and, and not in a small way. So my performing arts background was pretty ma massive. I was telling someone the other day that uh, one of my old colleagues, Sir Andrew Lloyd Webber, has just got the Oxford vaccine. And they're like, well, ha what? what? <laughs> and it's kind of this hidden part of me, right? So I was the head of sound for cats and I, you know, played around with Phantom and had some some things to do with Cirque du Soleil and was the head of sound at the Opera House. And I really got to play around with the highest performing celebrities in the world. Uh, so sometimes I'll ask people, what's your favourite band? And, and hope that I've probably worked with them, whether it's Metallica or Katie Lang or Cindy Lauper or, you know, we could name drop for, forever. But having that exposure to those older celebrities really got me excited about how that happened. You know, look at someone like uh, John Cleese, Monty Python. I got to work with him as the head of sound at the Opera House and he was in his 70s, right? And he was still doing what he'd done since his days uh, in his 20s. How do they have that kind of sustainable career? Look at Debbie Reynolds singing in the rain. I was sound designer for her in Australia here as well. How does someone have a career that spans from maybe five years old to 75 years old. It sounds impossible. Uh, so 
as much as I love that career and spent a long time with the performing arts guys, I really got excited by this concept of how they get parented, how they find out about their potential and their capacity, how they build on those strengths and talents, how they get around all the roadblocks. It's one of the first things that the media like to ask, you know, what's the what's the downside about this? What's the stuff that goes wrong here? And there, there is pitfall, there are pitfalls, there is things that go wrong. And really, how do they live? How do they, how did they live? How did they grow up? How were they parented? And how did they uh, bring that longevity to life? It's, it's still exciting for me. And I've been doing this coaching career now for eight years. Mm. So what's the, what's the difference between an Amy Winehouse genius <laughs> uh, and someone who has a 70 year career? What, 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 yeah. what, what are you, what are you noticing about the genius that flames out and the genius that has uh, sustainability? Yeah, it's a great question. And it's a great example as well, because you have got your Amy Winehouses, you have got your AI researchers that are perhaps in the top 0.01% in the world in terms of IQ, in terms of measured intelligence, uh, burning out in their 30s that happened to Push Singh and another guy called Chris McInstry. These are real kind of horror stories. Uh, and I don't think we have an answer to that. I don't think we have an answer to why does that brain go snap or why does that entire life go snap versus how does this one flourish? There are certain things that we can look at in the flourishing, but I don't think there's a, a one size fits all. This is, this is the answer. It was, it was something that was really interesting. I, I always wondered about Garth Brooks. Uh, you mm. know, Garth Brooks always talked about himself in the third person. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, people said it's really weird that God, Garth Brooks talks about himself in the third person then he talks about his wife by her last name miss yearwood miss yearwood um and what I, what i took from that was he doesn't believe his own press he like he he talks about garth brooks as garth brooks is separate from him he's a man he's a father he's a husband he's you know all those things garth brooks is this creation uh and i and, and i had a new appreciation for the separation uh of, of that uh, so, so this perspective there. Yeah, absolutely. Look, I don't know about how modesty fits in that much. And I don't know how much creating a persona fits in. What I do know is that the families that I get to work with now, and I don't say I work with children because I, I always include the parents in the coaching conversations. And I think that's mandatory research says that it's, uh, you know, more full circle. They get that reinforcement day to day. What I see with those families is a complete authenticity and a complete genuineness with the, how they come across. And even the ones that sound ludicrous and some of them do sound ludicrous, Mark, with what they can do. I'm talking about children that can solve Rubik's cubes blindfolded or can mm. memorize the, the yellow pages or can get a hundred percent on the nationwide test. They still, they're still children. They're still people. And they still have this complete humanness to them, which I find completely fascinating. I've got a couple of clients here that I wanted to um, mention just along that path. Mark. I've got two twin clients here in Perth. I don't actually have, Perth clients in Western Australia, all, all my clients are like Asia or the Eastern seaboard of Australia. Um, but I've got two here that are kind of in person and same roof, same genetics, of course, they're twins, same raising as in the same parenting. They eat the same food. They go to the same school. They're in the same class and two completely different individuals. I'm talking about one's fat, one's skinny, one's confident, one's shy, one's into sports, one's into animals, one's got a, a racks of science books and the other one's got pads of, of paper for drawing. Um, that kind of genuineness, that kind of authenticity, that kind of individuality is fascinating to me that I can't take all the papers that I know about and all the rigor that I know about and apply it in a general way to anyone. And in particular, these guys, where you'd think it'd be pretty easy to say, right, I can at least generalize to these guys because they've got the same parents, but they have completely different ways of showing up. 
Uh, and I love that about every single person. So let me ask you a question. Why, why are they your client? That's a great one. And I listened to one of your interviews with a therapist psychologist, and it was about all the stuff that goes wrong and how she gets called on to deal with anxiety. Mine's almost like the flip side of that. And uh, Professor Martin Seligman had a bit of an insight that got him to this stage where he moved from, you know, DSM-4 and diagnosing mental illness all the way through to positive psychology and looking at the other side of the coin, basically. And that's really where I am as a coach and probably a lot of your listeners are as a coach as well, that Thomas J. Leonard, the founder of coaching, used to say uh, coaching doesn't help make sick people better. It, it helps healthy people become extraordinary. And so the reason families come and see me is to take that healthy child and allow them to understand more of themselves, help them to understand their needs, their values, their strengths, probably something that we should all know, at least by the age of 30, but I've met 70 and 80 year olds that couldn't tell me their top five strengths or, you know, their behavioral style. That's the, or first, that's even the their... first questions I have with almost anybody who comes to me. You know, Great. It's, it's <laughs> like, I don't know, like I made all this money, but I don't know what my zone of genius is or, you know, I, I like I, it, it's, it's always baffling to people because it's usually right there in front of them. Mm, mm. Right? Yeah, it's absolutely. Something they take for granted. But I want to go back to the twins uh, because mm. I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated. So you're called in. They, do they have a gifted uh, some some sort of gift or something something that they're excelling at that that made them put them on your radar, or are they just two normal wonderful kids that are just trying to find their potential? Yeah, great question. So most of my clients come in with some sort of measured giftedness, and the majority of those have a measured giftedness when we're talking about intelligence. You could also have giftedness in thousands of other domains, right? So you could have a, a gifted dancer or a gifted singer or a gifted uh, golf player or a gifted tennis player. The list goes on. These guys, the, both of those twins in this example, are in the top 1% of IQ for their age. Well, all IQ is by age. And that translates to about 140 IQ. So in a class, <laughs> they think a lot differently. They're at eight years old with an IQ of 140. They're essentially eight multiplied by 1.4. So with my shoddy maths, you might get to nearly 12 years old, 11 and a half years old or so. So that's going to be a really uh, big challenge. And there might be a call for a therapist in some part of that. There's been some research that these guys have a higher level of anxiety than the general population. They might have twice uh, twice the likelihood of having diagnosed anxiety for various reasons. But certainly if you shove a 12-year-old in a class of eight-year-olds, it's, uh, it's pretty harsh. It might be the equivalent of shoving an eight-year-old, you know, one of their school sure. peers in a, in a classroom of four-year-olds. Also, there's the social aspect. Uh, you know, absolutely. You, you know, like, so my, my son, I remember in the second grade, uh, my oldest son, uh, they called us in and they said that, uh, he's being referred to the gifted program. And mm -hmm. we said, no, we don't want him in the gifted program. Uh, we want mm -hmm. him to just be a regular, normal kid. And they said, mm -hmm. no, he has to go. We can't teach him anymore. But what mm -hmm. was really interesting was he had some challenges socially. Mm -hmm. And when he moved to the other program, all of a sudden he now blossomed socially because now, yes. now like when, as he talked about in high school, him and his friends would sit and teach each other. He had three other friends who spoke other languages in his high school mm. and they would sit and teach each other their languages. So it, there mm. was a social aspect to that, which lowered the anxiety. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And it's one that doesn't seem logical even it's almost counterintuitive but it obviously makes a lot of sense so uh, that's one of the outcomes that we see with something like acceleration is the social benefits where some principles some administration argue for the opposite without having all the facts or without having that research available so, I want, so let me, I'm, I'm stuck on your I'm stuck on your twins. <laughs> cool. so, so now now I've established that your, your twins your twins have the IQ that's kind of the threshold of why you would be called in. Now they're two yes. different personalities. They still both have this IQ and there's two different mm -hmm. personalities. 
which means they yes. need to be parented differently. They needed, they need, you know, they have different needs. I, you know, having two sons, both of my sons were, were gifted in different areas. And I had a, you know, they're the, as uh, one of the child psychologists says, they're, the instructions to raising your child are written on their butt. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. So, so you come in and you, you, now you have two different kids. Uh, so, so tell me what you do there for, you know, what are you doing to help there? Yeah, look, it's a really good point, Mark, that the parents need to parent differently for different children. And again, I think that's something that seems pretty basic, but might sometimes fly over our heads, <laughs> that, it, that it might even be worthwhile having a reminder. Uh, so my coaching program, like a lot of coaches, is unscripted. There's really nothing in there that I can say is generic. It gets tailored to the clients, but there are some assessments that are pretty standard. They'll give unique results, but they're pretty standard. Look at something like the Gallup Strengths Finder and the Strengths Explorer. It's been normed to 10 million plus people, and then we can go and apply that to the family, apply that to each child. No, I'm actually, I'm actually more, I'm more interested in your unscripted piece because I'm, in, I'm yeah. what I'm interested in is what are your hopes for the kids, right? You go in mm. there and you actually have an ultimate goal. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, not the specific of what they're going to do, who they're going to be. What, what is your ultimate goal to help these kids who have this, this rocket fuel in them, uh, which could burn them out or could, you know, foster an, uh, an extraordinary life. What is your, mm-hmm. what, what is your goal with this? My goal is to listen to them. And sometimes it's the first time that they've ever been listened to. And, that can quite often be enough mm. just to sit down and read a book with them or to sit down and ask them the kind of coaching questions that we'd ask to adults. What are you most scared of? Uh, what would you do if you were 10 times bolder? I walked into a gifted school here in Adelaide in Australia and asked the children who here feels safe in the world. And only a couple of hands went up. So the one on one is, is sorry. That gave me goosebumps. That well, that was a pretty horrifying result. I, I wasn't expecting to have that uh, that outcome, but it it is probably a very familiar outcome to the majority of the population on Earth. And so then to apply that group question to an individual setting is what I do with with the children, including the twins. Uh, can you tell me your top ten achievements? Is there anything you'd like to tell me about your teacher? Because the traditional parenting in most examples says when the child comes in and says, I hate my teacher, we tell them, no, you don't say that. (laughs) But let's spin it around as a coach and say, well, tell me more about that. What is it that you hate about your teacher? And so being able to ask the hard questions like we would with an executive, certainly like we would with an adult, um, allows the child to open up. And then because the parent's in the room, they can also get essentially parent coaching out of that. And they can learn to either ask questions in different ways or listen from a different point of view. So what, what I'm hearing you say, so again, we're going to go back to my older son. Uh, again, gifted, brilliant. The, you know, his mind was, was uh, like sharper than anybody I'd ever encountered. But all he really cared about was baseball. <laughs> and all he wanted yeah. to do was be on a baseball. He wanted to be on the high school baseball team, which my, my ex-wife and I would snicker. We were like, we were like how is he ever going to be on one of the most elite high school teams in the country? Uh, never count either one of my kids out, by the way. Uh, they have more grit than anybody I've ever seen. Uh, so, but what we did as a, as a parenting team is we paid for baseball coaches, athletic coaches, like we work, we gave him everything he can because, in, in, and I didn't even know at the time that I was thinking this, I wanted him to be a well-rounded person. I wanted him to have what, what he needed. He could sit at the piano and play without learning. Mm-hmm. And one day I heard him playing in the piano and I walked over to him and I kissed him on the head and I said, you know, you're gifted at this. He said, I know, but why can't I be gifted at baseball? Mm-hmm. And in his freshman year in high school, I love that this is a story in my book, is he, uh, he got his braces off, he got contact lenses, he hit the gym, he grew a little bit. My, both my kids are blessed with my height, 5'7", um, <laughs> and turned into a complete stud. 
and won a high school championship. Has a big old ring to prove it, right? Never. And what I love is he's still smart. He's still all these things, still tells dad jokes at 23 years old, but he also is well-rounded and he plays baseball as in an adult league. And he's got like, so what I'm hearing is you're helping these people, these, these children grow into full range adults to be able to take care of their, take, take advantage of their gifts and live mm. full lives. Am I getting it's, that right? It's, it's as simple as that. Look at, uh, Joseph Campbell's follow your bliss. Right. And then Tim Ferriss gave us an update, uh, and I will probably not get the quote exact, but just do what excites you. Um, and then in an analysis of very high performing children, a professor by the name of Greenacre, she said, these children have a love affair with life mm. and it's baseball or it's these days Minecraft or it's their particular sport or their particular performing arts passion or their particular, oh, in my nerds, there's a lot of astronomy and geology and uh, coding or robotics. It's just allowing them to follow that, even if they're not particularly good at it, but allowing them to follow that passion. And, you know, if we're worried about things like persistence or just perseverance in general, there was a buzzword about grit for a while. That's the best way to do it is allowing them to fail or not achieve to maybe the highest level of their peers, but allow them to have that sense of competition going on. So yeah, as, as simple as that sounds, Mark, that's also a really important thing to have. Maybe one of the most important things to have is allowing them to follow what's interesting, exciting, or, or gives them that. And doesn't aliveness. necessarily come so easily to them, which is really kind of part of, you know, cause you talk about this. I love, there's a, there's a, there's a quote that I took to, from one of, one of your videos where you talk about uh, the percentage of people who are gifted, you know, with that high IQ and the percentage of people who are tall. And then mm -hmm. only a certain percentage of those tall people go into the NBA. And you say, and, and you say that unless this ability is coupled with resilience and grit and perseverance, which are things you learn from failing and pressing yourself against things, you know, you know, these people are just tall, right? They're just smart. It doesn't really mean anything. Uh, so, so I think that that is something that uh, us normal folk, you know, our, our, us regular run of the mill folk can really take from, from your work is, you know, it's great to have those gifts and talents. It'll only take you so far if you don't couple it with the things that can be acquired. Can you talk a little bit about that, especially because, you, you know, I, I, I love uh, one of the earlier books that you wrote. I think you wrote it back in 2013 about how to live your best life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, let me just touch on grit for a moment. So grit was a massive buzzword for ages. Uh, Dr. Angela Duckworth or associate professor Angela Duckworth came out with this idea of perseverance and all the academics fawned over it for ages. They were like, this is, you know, here's a new four letter word. Here's something we can talk about. And here's something that we can research and find some stats on. And actually both Dr. Angela and Professor Marty Seligman came out with a, a paper that said grit and perseverance outdoes IQ by about twice, you know, so the smart kid, in school, in homework, in academic performance in general is going to get beaten by the kid that sits I think, down. I think and, in her formula, she puts effort in twice and talks about why effort is in, you know, talent times effort and then effort times, you know, and in, in, to, to make your point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And look, it was a great paper and it hit all the right notes for a lot of people. Um the problem is it was kind of bullshit and I'm glad that we're having this conversation <laughs> now on the 20th of August because just recently, like in the last few weeks, there's been another paper that, have, that has come out that says intelligence outdoes grit by 90 times. So, the, of course, there's this element like the NBA players. You're probably in a bit of a harsh situation if you're four foot and you want to be on an NBA team. It's probably not going to work. Most NBA players are around seven foot or 
six foot over. Like there, there's mapping there that you need to be X to be in Y. And it's very, very similar for these high performance fields. You wouldn't find an Elon Musk with an IQ of 80, right? Or, you know, in the, in the lower um, percentile. There is an element of conscientiousness and this ties back to the bliss, the Joseph, Ca- Joseph Campbell bliss and the Tim Ferriss excitement and the Green Acre. And by the way, um, in the United States, it's, it's follow your bliss and follow your excitement, but make sure mm-hmm. you have health insurance. <laughs> Only if you have health insurance. If you don't have health insurance, fuck your passion. Because <laughs> you're going to die. We don't care. Mate, you're welcome to come over to Australia. Uh, and I'm not talking about betting the farm on this stuff. I'm just talking about, like your baseball example, I'm talking about allowing them to jump into things that don't seem familiar to us. A lot of my parents, a lot of my families have this fight about screen time or robotics or learning python or or even you know youtube or creating audio loops because the parents don't understand that they're not from that generation they were perhaps born in the 60s 70s perhaps 80s and a lot of this technology is very new to them so i'm i'm just talking about allowing the child to find and to follow something that is interesting to them. It doesn't have to be, you know, committing to something that will uh, that will compromise their entire future. So, so, so map so map this to to everybody. So, what are you learning in all your research that we can all learn that we can all apply to our lives? Look, one of the most exciting things for me at the moment is this concept of completely tailored uniqueness and not being able to generalize at all for any child for any human i can't go and say right you need um this nutrition because it's been set here because that might not be the case Uh, and i'm not talking about nutrition specifically because that's not something i advise i learn about nutrition the more i learn Uh it is about who it is who's eating whatever food right absolutely man absolutely for some children, it might be more socialization. For some of my clients, it might be less socialization. For some of my clients, it might be more productivity or allowing them to study more. And for some, it might be less. I had a client recently that was telling me um, he studies so much. I said, draw me up a schedule. And his schedule that he plotted out in a Google sheet was like, get up at 5 a.m., start my study, go to school, come home, do my study. He even had Sundays filled you know, with study slots. And we're talking about a 14, 15 year old child, ridiculous. Um, So (laughs) there are these tailored elements that I think is quite fascinating. The other element that I find fascinating is kind of outside of what we'd see in gifted academics. And it's this concept of, let's call it caring. Let's call it uh, a general, a general kindness. It was fascinating to me. One of the biggest articles I've written in the last couple of years was about Elon Musk's school in California. And in that school, I mean, uh, we could talk about that for ages. In that school, they do things way differently. They don't do handwriting. They just type because it's 2020. And these guys are going to be retiring in 2070, right? So why would we need to learn how to hold, hold a pen or a pencil? In the admissions process for this they don't take iq tests they don't um, have to pass like an sat level exam although some of these eight-year-olds could because in that in elon's same school they're working uh through year 12 content they're reading the iliad and the odyssey as their kind of child's reading in that admissions process the number one thing that those guys are looking for is kindness in the child. Isn't that strange? They're not looking for the the maths nerd. They're not looking for, can you tell me the top five strategies, opening strategies for chess? And they're not saying, what? how can you uh, articulate a project? How can you show me a design for a project? They're really? saying- that, 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 that filled me with hope when I read that, that they were looking for imagination, motivation, and kindness. That filled me mm. with such hope. That we're that maybe we are valuing quite a few things that will make the whole world better, not just our iPhone better. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I find that fascinating, and of course that ties into coaching as a whole. It ties back to Thomas Leonard's quote: "Making healthy 
people extraordinary. And I'm not talking about academic performance. I'm not talking even about uh, career or setting goals. I'm talking about being a kind person or being someone that has caring or someone that at least understands themselves and can contribute to others. And I, I, as I said, as I already said, I still find this fascinating. It's still fascinating to me that we can build this, that we can seek it out in others and that we can do it at these really young ages, you know, down to eight years old and maybe even before that. That's beautiful. So thank you. Uh, so tell me, what, what are you excited about now? What are you working on now that uh, you're bringing to the world? Uh, well, you've obviously heard about Steve Hardison's biography. Steve is a super, super high performer, and he just intrigued me so much. I got to meet him nearly a decade ago uh, in person in Arizona. If my background wasn't blurred, you'd be able to see the picture of me and him sitting in the background as my avatar to hold, you know, as, as who I hold myself to. So, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I, th I don't think you could find a better role model or a better colleague or peer to kind of want to be in line with because he's, he's a fascinating, fascinating dude. And, you know, when you talk about giftedness, when you talk about high performance, I think he is just an excellent example of someone who is alive and accessible that we can go and learn from and communicate with. He's an incredibly open person. Uh, so that one I've kind of handed that over to a development editor already. We've got about 700 pages from 101 different interviews uh, from his I'm life. I'm hoping I make the through. cut. I'm hoping, so. You'll be in there, Mark. It's a, really, there. it's a really small section, but it's, uh, I'm just hoping <laughs> I make the cut. So when is, that, when is that book supposed to come out? Uh, so we're looking for sometime next year. We're still doing a bit of development work on that to make sure that it's – because you don't want to put anything that's kind of second rate – out about anyone, but in particular about a living, in my view, a living saint or at least a, a living sage. Let's put it that way. Well, I'll, I'll go. I'll go with living with living <laughs> with living sage. You know, we've we've talked about him on. Uh, I've had so many guests who I have a mutual relationship with Steve on the podcast. Mm -hmm. we, my my audience is is uh, familiar with the ultimate coach. Uh, mm. You know, who, who we all learn from. Uh, so, where can people find you to learn more about what you're doing? So all of my stuff is at lifearchitect.com.au. There's a whole bunch of free stuff there. There's a whole bunch of accessible articles. I've got an academic background, but I'm not writing for academics. I don't think anyone should write for academics. So there's parenting, parenting articles there. There's a great article there about criticism and how criticism might not be useful for parenting children. There's an article on the irrelevance I, of By the way, I read that. I loved it. I love the way you took, again, for, for a young guy who's not a parent, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the love and care you put into what you, uh, your advice and your, your insights into parenting is, is, is so good. You know, having two adult sons, um, you even talk about like, you even have like Neil deGrasse Ty Tyson type articles like uh, neuro lace, uh, you know, these implants in your brain, like you go everywhere in, in the web website. So we're going to put that in the show notes so people can find you. Um, cool. What, bo yeah, what, what book, what book that you've written would you say is a great book to, to start learning about what you bring to the world? I'm trying to think of who said, um, that when he encounters people in the street, he kind of has to go backwards because they're kind of, if they've read an older book, he's outgrown that as the author and he kind of has to step back a little bit. And I feel like that with my blue book, that it's a little bit, uh, it's a, it's a, an older part of my evolution. It's, I think it's 2013 or so. So that one's not my favorite. There's some very practical tips in there. Uh, there are one or two things that I think would be updated now if I did a second edition. My absolute favorite one of mine is my green book. It's called Welcome. It actually came out of sitting down with Steve Hardison in his coaching office. And pretty much the next day, I started writing a daily email to quite a decent list uh, through a lot of countries in the world. And after a year of sending those, uh, sorry, weekly emails, after a year of sending those emails every Monday morning, I packaged it up into this green book called Welcome, Stories to Wake Up To, because it was Monday morning, wake up, read the email. 
And, you know, I haven't reread that, but when I have people quote that back to me, I think that is accessible and practical stories. They're kind of Steve Chandler short chapters, you know. I think <laughs> I think I can give the credit for the short chapters to Chandler because he's done we so many books We all like write that. more and more like Steve Chandler and Steve Pressfield <laughs> with the short chapters. Yeah. Absolutely. Why not? So, yeah, it's not super dry. It's something you can just pick up. And I'm going to put to that in the show favorite. notes so people can just click on it and find that. Because that sounds like yeah, the exact yeah. kind of book I want people to be introduced to you. But... Uh, yeah, as I said, that one's my favorite one. If I was a three or four year old, my favorite one would be my picture book. Uh, that's the easiest book I ever wrote. I wrote the text of that in maybe 10 or 20 minutes. It's 10 of the highest performing prodigies in the world. There's there's Tesla in there and there's a few of my clients in there. There's Alma Deutscher, who's a wonderful prodigy that wrote her first opera at the age of nine. Um, and for each of the children's stories, my illustrator went and she did all the hard work. Like she spent months and months on that and designed these beautiful, intricate, uh, let's call them graphics or, or hand-drawn pieces of art and that one's around the libraries here. It's actually at Elon's school as well. That one, to me, is just a really beautiful representation of the capabilities, the capacities of these children. And, of course, it's probably got the same kindness and caring message that we've spoken about. It's called People Like Me. It's about how they can find brains like them. Uh, because you might have, in Alma's case, you might have a seven-year-old who's thinking at the level of a 14-year-old, or if we're talking about her niche, her field of, of music, you might actually have her up in, you wouldn't even measure it by age. Some people just say she's the, the new Mozart. Uh, so for toddlers and for children, it's difficult to imagine that they will find people that think like them. And this is kind of a reminder that that it's possible and that there are other children, that other adults, there are other individuals out there that have the same way of seeing the world as they do. Beautiful. Now, Alan, again, the reason I had you on, the, on, on, on this podcast is because of who you are, not what you do, the heart you bring to everything. Uh, and I appreciate you sharing that with us on the show today. Awesome. Thanks, Mark. And, thank, and thanks for staying up late in Australia. I appreciate Rock that. Roll. Thank God for the thank God for technology. Uh, yeah, exactly. I wouldn't be I wouldn't be allowed over there anyway. We, I don't know if you know this, but we're in our sixth or seventh month of Australian citizens not being allowed to leave the country. Wow, you know, my and son it's... my son just got on a plane this morning, so I'm re we're recording this in late August uh, to mm. go to Israel. Uh, he's going mm. to yeshiva for a year in Israel, and somehow mm. he was able to get out of this country and be accepted into Israel, which is a, a kind of, again, perseverance, grit, yes. resilience. I have no idea how he pulled this off. It's, a, it's absolutely brilliant. Um, but Good someday we will be able adventure. to travel. Yes. Well, look, I'll come and say hi then for sure. Very cool. Uh, to everybody else, and remember remember, I told you that, that dog we're boarding? Uh, <laughs> He's, 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 a, he's, a, he's alive. He's alive. I don't think my engineers can do anything about that. As I was about to tell everybody who's listening, I just so appreciate your time and your attention. Please take care of yourself. Uh, and as we learned in this, uh, in this episode, be kind. I love you. Have a great rest of the day.